Yeah. Uh, thank you, Vivian, for joining our um, meetup and being a speaker. So, yeah, would you like to introduce a little bit of yourself and then start our presentation? Sure. Um, I am Vivian. Thank you for having me today. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about my experience in VR and all the different things I do in the industry. And we'll answer any questions because I have done a little bit of everything. Great, great. Yeah. Do you want to start your presentation? Oh, sure. Uh, so first, I want to uh, let everyone know that you can just ask you know, questions throughout and um, that uh, you can ask questions about any of these different topics, but I'll kind of give you the history of all that I've uh, done. And there's a little bit of videos as well. So let me just get to it. Uh, so. I am trying to press play. <laughs> um, oh, here, duh. Yeah, duh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I was like, how many different ones do you have to use? So, <laughs> no. all right. So, uh, I'm Vivian, and I have used some photos of all the different things that I've done. So, first and foremost, I love technology, and I started using VR as a curiosity for my work. And then I started using it personally, and from there, it just spiraled into all these different opportunities. So throughout, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know the different opportunities that we have in VR, and then what's kind of the missing, or the these little spots that like are, are untouched that completely have a have great potential. So, um, all right. First, I work at a place called Mather, and we work with uh, older adults as a nonprofit, and I particularly work with technology. So um, social media, and, and then um, I also teach tech classes and courses as well as tech help. So from you know, smartphones to um, smart homes, which is my favorite. Uh, and then I started introducing newer technology such as VR. So you can see here where we're um, showing different uh, of our customers as well as our staff, um, and then working with different vendors who work specifically with older adults. So mainly my job is to address issues of isolation um, and loneliness. Loneliness being um, uh, something that you can feel like not the part in your brain that feels loneliness is also what feels physical pain. And so that's something that we we definitely address and it happens once you get older but especially right now because we're in a very unique time where the people who we serve grew up where there was not even anything remotely like this in fact i interviewed uh, someone and he was uh 98 at the time that i interviewed him which was a few years ago so um he I asked him, um, of all the things that you've seen, in you know, for technology advancements, what has been your, you know, your favorite thing or the most impressive and, you know, was it the telephone or the computer or the TV? And he said it was refrigeration. So <laughs> that he said, yeah, when refrigeration came out, that was really cool. <laughs> so, and it's not because he doesn't use technology, but just imagine all that we have gone through to be where we are today. And it's, it's funny and in uh, some ironic ways that we are doing things virtually in order to feel real. Um, and we'll get into that. But, but um, with loneliness um, and isolation among older adults, it's also because we're a global world. And so people uh, can easily move and their children might move far away from them. Our services dwindle. Uh, be, as things become more online, so it, it's less it's less prevalent for people, and so we have people who are, you know, um, completely isolated or they're homebound. So imagine that you are someone who is, um, you know, you just retired and you don't have family or your kids moved away, and you have nothing around you, and then you can't drive anymore. So it's a very like frustrating pattern for our 
for our um, older adults. And, and it would be for really anyone because I, I, obviously isolation affects everybody. Um, but uh, so we, what we did was create a program called Telephone Topics. And it is exactly that, it's on the telephone because the telephone is the most um, easily accessible uh, technology for everyone. So people would call during the weekday for a live program that we would do on the phone. And it started out like that. We started this in 2007 and I've been with Mather for 12 years. So, uh, so it was on the telephone, but then of course we, we had to evolve the program. Um, and, and that turned into um, what we know today and such as Zoom. So today, because of the pandemic as well, we've grown the program and we do about 100 programs a month that are live programs on Zoom as well as the telephone. So we want to continue to always be accessible to everybody. Uh, and these calls range from uh, just uh, like authors. We had some cookbook authors and former like actresses from shows that our customers would would know uh, and our meditation yoga all kinds of different things so we actually were already doing it before the pandemic so it, we were already kind of prepared for it in a sense because we've already been working on addressing when you don't have access to anything or services so this is a way for people to connect every day and some of these people we've talked to for over 10 years, I've never seen what they look like. They've always only been on the phone. So we've been able to build these relationships on the phone. So one of the things about working with, with, uh, within this industry in gerontology is the resistance to technology in general. Uh, there's a lot of resistance from uh, uh, the customers or the residents or from the older adults, uh, but also from people working within it because it's such a reactive industry where um, we wait for something to happen because everything is, everyone's aging right now and people need services right now and there's not a lot of, um, of help in this area. So it's constantly trying to put out fires essentially and not so much for planning for the future um, but I mean, luckily we did do a lot of that already with programs like telephone topics. So, uh, so there is a lot of resistance to it, but, uh, I think that especially for right now, we can definitely see the value in it. Um, and one of the things that we say is that we want to reach people where, where they are, like meet them where they are. And so it becomes a lot more about the people when it goes online because we can't guarantee how old anyone is we you know you're not going to card someone online or over the phone um, so it becomes more of a needs-based type of service so once i started doing vr uh, and kind of learning about it and how we could use it at our at our work um, it led into me actually just using it myself so and that like helped me see that there are people all ages all backgrounds all over the world who crave the same thing that we all need which is connection uh, human connection so throughout my time working um in vr in general i've met a lot of people who are um who remind me just of the same customers that i work with people who use vr because they are agoraphobic or they um, are extremely shy or they can't talk or have anxiety. Uh, and not just, not just uh, people who have these ailments, it's just that it, it's, it's, um, it, it's where they would go, right? Because if you're stuck at home, but you want that one thing, so you kind of just naturally go to technology because it allows you a window to the outside. So that's how I first got started. And I continue to work with uh, different people in the industry who are doing things for this field, such as uh, you see on the left here, that's um, Mind VR. That was when they first started because that's, as you see, is the gear, which is no longer um, a, a product that is, is being used. So they've also evolved their services and you see here that you know we're using the vive because we we started this 
back when it came out. So, you know, the Vive was the only one really with the controllers until Oculus came out. So um, I should also mention how I look at virtual reality. So in the sense of, um, of my philosophy with it is that um, you only need your perception to be somewhat similar to real life for it to be real for you. Uh, there's a lot of talk about um, what is real and isn't um, and things such as um, personal space that is easy to talk about in person because it's physical. Uh, how does that transcend into a virtual space? But for me, um, I do believe that um, you just need, you just need to be in VR to sense it and, and to be there. So it doesn't take away from you actually experiencing the same things that you might psychologically uh, through VR that you would in real life. And, and I'll go more into in depth with that. But uh, but I know that it's obviously it's it's VR, right? It's virtual and, and it can be more like geared towards fun, especially now when it's more consumer based. But there is something about it that brings up a lot more questions as technology does tend to do once it evolves, uh, such as, again, interaction with people and the, how you behave in VR uh, and um, the type of <clears throat> the limitations in VR that you, when you have to address certain things that uh, are easier in real life, don't. So <clears throat> this is some of the shows that I've done in VR. So uh, since I have already done public speaking and, and uh, sessions and classes on uh, all kinds of different topics, but mostly, on uh, technology, that's something that I'm comfortable doing. And so these are all from Altspace, which I'm sure you're familiar with, with X Reality. Uh, and what Altspace is, is a social VR platform. So it would be like um, any of the social medias, if, if that was um, in VR, basically, you kind of roam around and, and see people. Uh, and when I say see people, you see an avatar representation of them. And you can do, you know, anything as far as your imagination goes, right? And as far as like the skills that you um, invest in learning in VR. But how I started a show is there was a competition for a um, VR talk show. It was called like Who Wants to Be a VR Talk Show? And you can look that up. It was just a competition in 2017 and it was for a custom avatar. And I, I don't know that it was necessarily important to me because I started using Allspace to present on work already. So um, I, I guess it was, you know, for fun really, but I did end up winning. So if you look at the avatars here, <laughs> Um, those are, that's me. And then here's another one of me when they, uh, they redid it. There's a joke at Allspace that I have the most avatars out of anybody because just because of the circumstances of me um, winning it right before they were bought out by Microsoft. So the unique thing about Allspace and why um, I used it most often was because of its accessibility. You could access it through the VR headsets, um, you know, HTC all the way down to gear VR on your phone, and then also in 2D. So if you look in the third tile over here, the Hive featuring um, Jay Bonansinga, he it, actually, he just announced that he's um, putting out work that he did with um, Stan Lee. So he, and that's Stan Lee, that's comic books, right? And he did The Walking Dead uh, and he's, um, he writes mostly thrillers. He never did VR. And he's just somebody that I know who um, did programs for my other job. And so I found that what he was doing would fit the audience of, of the people in uh, VR because it's, it's pop culture that is relevant. Um, and there's also like Walking Dead games, et cetera. So I was trying to really bridge between what I knew in, that entertained people um, and then trying to see how it can be brought into VR. But for all intents and purposes, it was a talk show like a studio talk show where we produced a stage. Um, there was a backstage and there was a place for the audience. There were producers who, you know, we would work on getting guests, securing them, making the image, putting together the presentation. 
um, all kinds of things that you would do if you were doing a, a production um, that was live to a studio audience. So the fun thing though is that the studio audience is is in Bihar and so that's where it confuses people so um because you have to be in VR to really feel immersive otherwise if you're watching in 2D or if I'm explaining it to you and you've never been in VR it's it's a really hard concept to to grasp so uh anyway I ended up doing a lot of different shows and we did it in a lot of different places, not just in alt space. We did it in Somnium space. We did it in uh, Sansar. For some time, we were in VR chat because of the um, uh, bef when alt space announced that they were um, closing, and then Microsoft bought them out. I did my show in VR chat for some time in there. So we've been doing shows since 2017, and. The unique thing about our show is that we do treat it like a full-blown production. You know, we have a whole team that puts it together. We do um, just as organized as we possibly can to make people feel as comfortable as they possibly can. Uh, and then, we, you know, we find interesting people to interview from here. We have um, a small business owners here who they, they've um, are like create different types of content in VR. Um, we have game studios like Big Breezy Boat here or content creators like Reality Check um, or players who play VR esports professionally. Um, and then, you know, things like um, other areas since I was more focused on enterprise VR at the time, um, we have the US Air Force here. So as you can see, it's a, a variety of different topics and that's kind of what made it fun, is that you can meet all these different people in VR. Uh, and it felt like you really did meet them. Um, and the audience really was there. So it's funny, uh, you would think that you wouldn't have like stage fright or something, but, but it does, I mean, I, I can't say it does feel real. It really is a studio audience there. They're just on headsets. Um, and over time, we realized that we collected all of this data on, on hosting shows, um, uh, how the audience behaves, um, what's the best way to make it entertaining for them, uh, how to make it so that you can run a production without disturbance because in a in a real studio like a physical studio you might have a producer who's you know holding up signs and and talking to a headset so those are things that we had to figure out how to do and that's something that we've carried on to what we do now um, and then we've also expanded into very like meta events that you'll see in a moment here. Uh, so like for instance, this one's called the, we did the virtual reality day after party. Um, and for that show, I literally went to a bunch of different VR platforms while the party was in alt space. So the audience was in alt space watching, um, you know, I did an introduction and I said, okay, we're gonna go metaverse hopping. Um, so then I left all space and then I was on the screen and then I went into Orbis and interviewed the devs there. And then I went over to VR chat and, you know, all these different places that have multiplayer or a big breezy boat, for example, to show all the different um, ways that people can connect and use all these apps um, while people were watching um in alt space and then we had a you know moderator who the host who was hosting it in alt space while i was hopping around and since we you know worked out how to do it live um he was able to ask me live questions from the audience while i was in different spaces so that's how we've always done it when we are hosting in you know facebook spaces or uh, again like sansar we always brought it back to alt space because alt space is really made for events and they have interesting technology that allows you to have um you know hundreds thousands of people in a single event with um without being in the same occupying the same space with their front row technology so that was um the adventures of um of starting the show and 
it wasn't until I did an episode called Behind the Scenes, very similar to this one, um, that I thought, well, this would be a fun way to show the audience how we get ready for a show. And that one ended up running, you know, two hours, even though we are strictly 30 minutes. That's our show, 30 minutes. Um, and people had so many questions and we were able to answer them. Surprisingly, I was thinking like, well, we've done, you know, about like a hundred events or so, but it's, every event is different and you're still learning each time. But with each question, we were like, yeah, that did happen to us on this episode. And this is how we solved that problem. So, um, so we did gain a lot of, of knowledge and, um, and also our preference for running an event. So typically people would say, okay, an event is an hour. We did start out with an hour show. Um, uh, but running an hour show weekly, it's a lot of work. Even doing it for 30 minutes is a lot of work as well as people don't really think so because you think, well, it's a virtual event. So you just hop in and just host it. Uh, but a lot, uh, again, like I said, a lot of production goes into it. And then the developer who is in charge of uh, like the head developer of the show might have to make changes to the stage. So we did a lot of different fun things just to show the unique ways to use the space and the concept of, um, of talk shows. So, uh, and again, the 30 minutes is because I think that having someone sit for an hour in VR with a headset was a bit much. Uh, and of course, uh, when people talk about the numbers of people that come into the show, like ours got cut down because, you know, the show's only 30 minutes, you're missing time that people can be coming in and out. But we really wanted people to come to the show and then be there and like watch the production and and enjoy the show and then, you know, be able to, to ask questions off camera if there were any questions for the guests. Okay, so here's just some fun pictures of the, you know, the shows that I did or the people I've met. Um, uh, right here in the center, that's this is Oculus Connect 5. So I was actually um, invited because of the work I did with the Hive. And then we also got to, you know, tour Facebook, which is down here below, uh, because Lisa, who works for Facebook, also worked for Altspace for some time. So uh, that's how um i got to tour there because i knew i knew lisa and she you know recalled the show and i remember this photo because i was the one that asked everyone to do it i said hey let's all like meet here and take a photo and you know a lot of people came and it was a lot of fun considering um, most of these people here i only met virtually actually at this time i think i've only met people virtually here and it was funny because we've all hung out in VR or talked on Twitter or, or in forums. Um, so we all knew each other. But the minute we all met each other, it was like we already had met each other. And we were like giving hugs, like, I mean, instantly. It was like, oh my gosh, and you recognize each other. And then we're like, wait a minute, have we met for real yet? So uh, honestly, to this day, because I've been doing VR for so long, socially, it's hard to remember that, wait, we have met and we did hang out or, you know, beyond that, but it does extend beyond just like many things online. When you meet people online or there's online dating uh, or, or meetup, for example, is something that started after um, of 9-11 to get people to actually physically meet and be together. So, um, so yeah, it always felt like we were just hanging out and, and now... I think about it, I mean, there's so many people that I've met and I've been a part of like their, their lives as much as they've been a part of mine. You know, I've been invited to their weddings or their big birthday bashes or celebrations or just hanging out for the weekend or uh, graduations, all kinds of different things um, that started in VR and just started because I wandered into all space because it was in alphabetical order and, um, you know, just begin this evolution of um, of shows. So as you can see with VR, um, it's what you put into it, right? And that's really, of course, with anything. Um, and for me, it wasn't so much that I wanted to continue doing a show. It was more like I couldn't stop because people were requesting it often. You know, they wanted to um, either be on the show because there weren't many you know, uh, VR talk shows in the space at the, in the beginning, um, in this way. 
So, so then I just, you know, kept at it again. This was like for fun, you know, and, and before we started doing more like consultation and, and doing other productions with bigger studios, it was just a bunch of us just having fun and, and doing a show. Um, and over here on the right, that's with uh, Anna and, and Pixel Rip. That was a lot of fun. Uh, and then this is on the bottom um, right here is the actual uh, Alt Space team that I, I went to. I went to their offices, and this was a fun episode because what we did was for the Hive show, we were, you know, in the VR studio, and on the screen was me live. IRL wearing the same blue dress see as my avatar up here <laughs> so I wore the blue dress as well and I said I'm at all space you know offices and so we all met everyone um, and I walked them around and showed them different things and then what we did was okay and then we'll we'll be right back and we turned off the live feed and each of us put on a headset in different spaces in the offices and then we came in and played a game so we made a uh, fun game for them to like compete like a, it was like trivia really. Um, and, and that's something that we did. Like we had to think about how you can do a simple game in VR because again, there's not, you know, cards that you can easily flip. Uh, everything has to be programmed, you know, adding scores or indicating who's talking, um, accounting for things like audio delay. So a lot, a lot goes into it. So um, as simple as some of the games might sound, it was actually a lot of, of work to put into um, each episode if the developer had to, you know, for instance, make a whole brand new stage. So we began to collect a lot of assets as well and learned a lot about how, um, how different things can be programmed and, and how they can work. Um, over here on the top left, this was a really great episode. Um, this was a, 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 a touching one. So in the audience here, you know, you'll, it looks maybe like 20 people, but again, um, you can have thousands of people because of, uh, their front row technology. So the first program I had, I think it was like 500 people, but it was just me in the room with the moderator. Everyone else was mirrored in. Um, so there's just, they're in a different instance of the event and the way that alt space allows you to see that there are people in other events is you see these, um, these, um, emojis here, the hand clap, the hearts, you can see them come up from like a little like orb indicating that that's somebody else from another room, for example. And, and again, that's something else that is, is interesting. So if you are somebody like myself who likes to tell jokes or, um, you know, tr tries to be funny, uh, you don't get the same reaction in VR, right? Uh, it's not like people are gonna immediately laugh um, or clap or groan or what, however they would react in real life. So you have to be confident that what you said, it was funny, but they're muted and, and you don't hear them laughing and you have to be okay with that. If, if you are a performer, you know that that is, you know, you feed off of the feedback that you get from the audience. So we always encourage them to use emojis to encourage our guests because, you know, again, stage fright. In this particular episode, the person who's with me on the right, um, this is just a view from the stage, is, uh, is someone named Mika. And she is a friend that I met in VR and then after six months um, came out to all of us as, a, as transgender. And so that opened up yet again, another a way that VR helps people um, because she comes from a conservative family and felt that she could never come out. Um, and using VR where she could dress in a, um, a female avatar, like helped her with identification. And so in this episode, we talk about, about her experience with that. And it was a lot more, um, you know, emotional for her. I mean, obviously it, it is a, a deep topic, even though most everyone in this audience here knows Mika and loves Mika, you know, she's, she's very funny. Um, and she actually became quite well known um, in places like VR chat. Um, and then you also see the, um, this person in blue here, that's Stevie boy. Um, from this episode, he, 
he told me that this was the first time he like kind of talked and participated. He told his story as well. And then he started his own event and it's called, um, their, um, there's their improv show and it's, uh, they'll be celebrating their three year anniversary. And they asked me to come to it because, um, it was from this episode that sparked them wanting to do it. So from the hive, not only did, um, we spark some shows, we actually then produced a lot of different shows. In addition to the hive with Vivian, we also did, um, a show with, um, a streamer named uh, Sad Gamer Dad. So his was focused on on gaming, whereas mine was more focused on enterprise and and um, and uh, like different industries like outside of gaming. Um, and it also allowed us to do different things here. Like this is with the Allspace staff, where I had to do a presentation um, in. A, a, a for a conference but I couldn't go because I was sick so we did it all virtually instead and it worked out fine because we were displaying what was so good about it um, so I'm gonna talk about my use of it as well so I told you that I um, I uh, you know worked in technology and then I used it for fun um, and then I used it to create content. Um, but then I, about a year after using it, I was diagnosed with cancer. And it was a, a very rare cancer. It was so rare, they really couldn't give me any statistics about the cancer itself, only what happened with the people who had it previous to me. So it was an aggressive cancer that, um, uh, it was a, it's a neuroendocrine. So, um, yeah, it, and then the form that I had was even rare of a, of a rare cancer. So it was a lot of um, a lot for me to handle from working full time, um, and uh, you know I, I had just gotten a divorce as well, and it was just like so much happening all at once. Um, and I also live alone in in Chicago, uh, so my family is in in California and I have my daughter here, but essentially I was alone. You know, my family flew in for when I was, um, undergoing treatment, but because of the severity of the cancer, I really did chemo on my own. Usually they'll have people doing it in a room with others. Um, I had to be in a separate room. So I was like quarantined. So I did that before school, quarantining myself, uh, basically. But what you see here is me using Samsung gear. Now, um, I've actually worked with the people who are working on Samsung gear back when, um, and most of the things that I do professionally are on the enterprise level, where it may be working with people who do things for, um, like real estate or, um, uh, this is like for more health. So it's called like, um, this, like a pain distraction type of thing. Um, we have like researchers. So it's a lot, a lot of different um, areas and, and, and uh, applications for VR. But, but anyway, um, battling cancer was difficult because it, you know, messed with my brain and how I uh, could, I mean, you'll probably hear me right now. I used to not forget so many words all the time, but you know, it, it made me forget words or how to say certain things or, um, or I can just completely lose my train of thought in a very, very like noticeable way. So, uh, so it was very diff difficult and isolating for me, but I used VR, you know, because I've already, showed people how to use it and I'm already uh, working with people who are isolated and I've already under, um, I understand the ramifications of loneliness and what happens when you're isolated. So, um, so I was able to use it while I was, you know, doing chemo. Uh, in fact, I, I had one last episode that was scheduled. This it was scheduled before I found out, before I was diagnosed. Um, and I wanted to do it. And um, it was before I was going to go in for surgery, but I had an emergency. Like I, it was I was in so much pain. I was rushed to the hospital, and because I was going into surgery, the doctor said like I couldn't leave because I was losing so much blood, and they needed to monitor me in order to make sure I could get 
have the surgery. So I was just in the hospital for five days then. Um, and I was like, but I have a show, you know, the show must go on. So I did the show while doing a blood transfusion on my gear. So you can do anything really <laughs> in VR if you put your mind to it. But, uh, and I, again, I think that was the first time our show was 30 minutes <laughs> because I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm here. And then I was like, I'm really tired now, but the show went well. And it's, it's an episode that's still up. Um, and you know, those are, that's one of my moments where I felt like, um, um, you know, I, I can't really do anything, you know, and, and this can help anybody. So one of the things that really helped me as a patient, so, so somebody who is a use case, not somebody who's just you know, saying like, oh, I can do this and this, like I actually have done it. And so I can tell you from my perspective as, um, as a patient, um, one of the, the um, things with uh, chemo is that I had to take a lot of, um, uh, oh boy, I now forget, steroids, there we go, a lot of steroids um, in order to um, offset the nausea and, and pain. Um, but what that ended up doing was a, the chemo made me extremely exhausted and tired but the steroids made me really like frantic and and jittery so um i was just kind of like on my on my couch you know just like oh my gosh i want to move i'm moving and moving so fast but my brain is just like here on this couch i can't physically move so i put on a vr headset and you know this is of course is anecdotal right now um but but what it felt like was that um, my brain with the perception of VR was reconciling the actual physical movement that I was doing, you know? So it calmed me down because I was too tired to move. So VR allowed me to move um, and that helped my brain think that, okay, you are, you're moving, you're fine. And that calmed me down. So that was a very cool um, experience too. And that's, that's something that's anecdotal, especially because VR is still new for consumers. It's, I mean, it's been around for a long time. I mean, I work with people who've like, who've been doing it since the seventies and they're jaded with it or people who've been doing it since, um, I know this man, he, he sold his technology. It was like 30 years ago. And then he works for the company that he sold it to. And we have, we, you know, we meet often and just, just to kind of check up with each other. And when I tell him I'm doing all these things, he's like, wow, he had, you know, he's like, wow, there's social VR. He's like, and there's gaming. He just like had no idea, but he was there from the beginning. So, uh, so it is a wide industry as far as people who've been working on the type of technology, but for consumers and for people starting to understand what it can do, there's not enough, um, information yet to have a definitive data. So we're still in that process, which is, so it's a great time for researchers. You know, like we had um, research projects planned as well um, for VR. So there's a lot of different topics that you can do um, and, and apps and people who are trying to achieve certain things. So turning into your research uh, it really allows us to understand it a lot more. But that was my anecdotal piece that, you know, is a part of different studies now. Um, so I, I want to kind of show some of the fun things that we do in VR. So if you've heard of this game called Beat Saber, it is, you know, the, the most popular game in, in VR. It's a, you know, it's a headset seller, as they call it. So what happened with Beat Saber just recently? Uh, they are a multiplayer game. But when Beat Saber came out, the community, there was a lot of uh, modders in the community and they had a multiplayer uh, modification to the game. So what we did was we took a replication of Beat Saber, the environment, so you see the little spiral there, and we ported that into Altspace. So now you're in Altspace in Beat Saber. Um, and then you see each of us on the stage there and some of us are moving, some of us are not. It's because we are actually playing Beat Saber right then. So what we did was launch Altspace, launched Beat Saber and streamed our point of view. And then our producer, um, you know, he moved our points of view so that people can see, but we're actually all competing against each other. So you see there's a scoreboard there um, and each of us have a little bit like different colors. And then one of our developers, you know, developed um, headsets and 
and saber swords so that you could feel like you're in there even though you're in the game and you see people in the audience how they're kind of like moving along too with what they see so they're also having fun and and again i talked about accessibility so there are people who couldn't had never played beat saber because they they only access vr through a gear or the community through um a, a 2D screen. So this was a really fun, immersive experience for us. Um, and then, um, and this is something we do because we're a little bit crazy. <laughs> you know, like, what if we did this? So um, uh, it was so much fun. Uh, so we did it again. <laughs> uh, so this is, um, this is a game called Onward. And this is actually a game that I went on to compete in. And I, I cast for, I shout cast for it. But the, this neighborhood that they're in is actually a map within the game itself. And so we ported the assets of this, which is just public assets. We put it into all space and keep in mind, um, this is when Onward was a strictly a PC VR game. So we optimized the room and it took a lot of work to optimize it for people to access it on the gear. Then we had the um, casters who already casted the game come into it and cast the game within the game environment so on the screen it's the same thing just like beat saber um, we had a tournament people had their um their their pov while um, it was being casted inside the map and again this allowed for accessibility for people who have never heard of it or never played it um and again and this also evolved into me um doing uh, vr esports so you know, I, I shared with you that I had uh, cancer and that made it um, just difficult for me to do really anything. So I completely understand the concept of quarantine as I had to do it for a long time. Um, and uh, I went to OC5 and I saw esports, like VR esports on, on the um, on stage and my friend who is a, he's a writer in, in vr um he was like oh let me introduce you to one of the players so then that player became a guest on my show um i interviewed him and then i was like well i guess i have to play it because you know um you're my guest and um i not i was not a gamer <laughs> like i would go in to play the games of the developers because of course i'm interviewing them so i want to experience it but i was terrified of this i not you know i never shot a gun in real life and just all kinds of different things i've um uh, it's an fps is a first person shooter it's a milsim it's a very intense game so i did it and i was scared absolutely frightened i was like oh my gosh i just want to crawl in bed and eat ice cream and watch romantic comedies this is a little too much for me um but then some uh streamers heard i played onward and they thought it was hilarious because they knew me and they're like you did not play that game that is not your style so then they were like can we stream you playing it because you know for for fun laughs. <laughs> but of course, you know, they're my friends. I'm like, all right, let's do it. And then something clicked where, you know what, I actually started to enjoy it. Um, and then I started a team called the Colettos. And it was an all girls team because we had talked about it. We we're like, oh, we should have an all girls team. So um, usually when I say something, I, I, I try and achieve it because it it's what makes life fun, right? So um, I played it, you know, it had this amazing effect on me um, personally, because after I had cancer, um, or after I was in remission and, um, you know, was, was getting better, you know, I told you like it affected me a lot in how I thought and how I physically felt and all kinds of different changes that I had to deal with. And uh, it was very frustrating for people who knew me before, um, to kind of uh, understand, even though they understood that I was sick, it's hard when the person that you know changes, even for circumstances such as getting sick. Uh, and that was frustrating for me. And it was frustrating when you know I, I couldn't think of the words, uh, or I couldn't say exactly what I was trying, or what I was thinking, or I wasn't you know on top of things as much anymore. And this game really helped me because while it's intense, while I'm not a gamer, well I am now, but. Um, it allowed a few things. One is that it gave me a singular objective. So in this game, you're just trying to go up to a satellite and input a code within six minutes and you work with a team to do that. All right. And then, and then you switch sides and then you defend it. So you're either going to defend it or you're going to attack it. Uh, and it's in six minutes. And then you just keep doing it back and forth until one team gets to four points. So it's best of seven. And that meant that um, I had an objective that was very clear. 
Um, I had people who I just met and knew, did not know me before. So had no, you know, preconceived ideas of what I could or could or couldn't do. And, and because um, I usually am the teacher, uh, I, that was a really hard thing. And in this case, no one expected me to be the leader or the teacher. Um, this was a community of people who've been playing it for a while and they were, you know, happy to show me how to do it. And I happily was completely naive, you know, and I just, I let them lead me and, um, and there was no judgment for it. So it really helped me, um, kind of get a sense of myself back and then also discover things that I didn't think I could do. So uh, I think that um, as a game and as a player, it helped me a lot. And I know that for other people, it helped them too, because I do get messages from people who share a lot of similar experiences that I did as well. Um, and then again, from there, it evolved. And then I um, started shout casting and, um, and now I work with a V respawn and we do a lot of uh, marketing or we work with leagues to do um, tournaments or, or we help them with their productions. Uh, and then we also add this layer of um, social uh, VR to, to it. So it, it, you might play esports um, and you're focused on running a league or the tournament or the game, but maybe you don't have that time or energy to work with a community or, you know, get people involved in it. So that was something that, you know, I really enjoyed uh, being able to do and help with the community. Um, and uh, this is esports again is like, it, it is a field that is just highly untapped in VR. Um, it, we have leagues, you know, there are people who are doing really cool things, um, but it's just largely untapped in general. And so it's definitely a uh, point of um, opportunity that I can go into detail with. Um, so here's just some examples of us doing like remote production. Um, and so I'm directing it while that, you know, that I'm talking in their ear and they look like they're sitting next to each other, but they're not. <laughs> they are in two different spaces. Um, and we just, uh, we use green screen and, uh, well, and one of them is actually in that studio and we, we just, you know, make it look like they're in the same space. Um, and this is stuff that we were doing before the pandemic that now is quite helpful. So, um, you see them playing here on the right and then on the left is the studio that we had at V Respawn. Um, so here's my contact information. I know it's up to the hour. Um, I do have videos if you want to see, um, you know, like a little bit more of examples um, as it goes. I'd be happy to show that or I can answer any questions. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Vivian, for uh, your uh, presentation. And I really admire your um, spirit. Yeah, and I learned that you got cancered and uh, kind of in your like low point in your life. And I think VR pretty much helped you to kind of like view yourself again. So I, yeah, I, I mean, that's, that, that, that's a really good experience. Yeah, I think it's really cool. Yeah, it definitely was, so. Yeah, uh, yeah, we have some, um, yeah. Uh, any questions? I think, yeah, do you want to unmute yourself and ask Vivian questions? Uh, hi, Vivian. It was a really touching story and really inspiring for somebody who's new to technology. I'm a product manager, but in a totally different space. And mm -hmm. uh, I am curious to begin my journey into augmented reality and virtual reality in healthcare because I right now work in healthcare. What would you suggest? Where do I begin from? Like, I am an absolute beginner, haven't explored anything. I have a uh, VR set at my home, but I don't play games on it. So mm -hmm. it's a completely new territory for me. But I would sure. really like to learn more. Sure. I'd be happy to talk about that um, because my main job is technology adoption, um, especially for people who, again, may resist it. So there you see that there's a lot that can be done with the technology but getting people to understand it and then put on the headset i mean there are things that you have to take into consideration just as uh, from a, a standpoint of uh, like i say a, an anthropologist which you know like i took anthropology um 
people feel a, a few things. Um, and I understand this from just teaching technology is uh, they feel um, kind of silly. You know, they're putting on a headset and they can't see who sees them. Um, and they know that they're doing things that in real life, you know, look, look silly. And, and that is part of it where people have to feel comfortable. Um, and so you have to like, uh, first get people to want to try it. And of course, um, trying it yourself. So if it's brand new for you, you're in luck. Anybody who wants to get into it is in luck because it's still growing. It's not where I think some of us expected it to be right now, um, but it's getting there. Um, and uh, in, in the ways that it, it was very difficult to get into, you had to buy um, a computer that was you know, that's thousands of dollars and then a headset that, uh, you know, uh, upwards of $700. And then now with the new index, it's, you know, that's like spending over a thousand dollars to have a, a setup. So it, it was a huge investment and not many people were willing to do that. On top of the investment, you have the troubleshooting. Um, as you saw from all of our productions, it's a lot of things that you may not think that people have to do. And, and of course there's people who are very creative, like on YouTube, um, or TikTok or Instagram, where they're creating content and, and we have to think of new ways to do it. But in VR, because there's not many people that you can ask, um, you kind of have to figure it out as you go. So it does require people who have patience, um, people who um, want to take the time to learn and try new things. So that's a very important thing to keep in mind is that um, you're going to have a lot of time where uh, you'll have to troubleshoot. Um, so, so the technical aspect is just learning how it works. And I should let you know that I, while I understand programming and, um, uh, and developing more, it's more so in concepts because I, you know, I'm a project manager. So I also have to explain what we want uh, or like the, what the UX is that we're looking for, for the developer to understand and then to implement it. And then of course, it's never implemented the way that you want it to be implemented, you know, at all times. So then you have to figure out how to adjust the expectations of the experience you wanted. So, um, so leaving a lot of room for that type of thing, um, it, you know, introducing it to people, um, getting people on board first is really important. Uh, and then allowing people to try it. So, what I did was, um, you know, I, in, in my company, I heard that somebody had a meeting with this company that was like getting, trying to get people to buy into their cardboard VR box, which is not VR. And I heard this and I went to them and I said, well, why did you do that? You know, I work right here and I have VR and they're like, you do? So then the next day I brought in my computer and I had people try it. And the first thing I had them try was a uh, Richie's Plank experience. One, because I, uh, I work with them. So, uh, you know, it's funny. So, you know, you're in the elevator, you look down and it's like uh, over a hundred stories or something. And then you have to walk out on a plank. It was hilarious because people were like, oh, you know, like, again, I work with people who aren't in technology. So they just thought it was, you know, silly and, um, you know, that they look silly doing it or all kinds of different things. So then they, um, would go in and then they would say like, okay, I cannot do this. And they would stop, they would take off the headset <laughs> or people would do it, but then they would get really scared, you know? So um, that was fun. So that became something that um, was like a, uh, kind of like, um, what is it? When, like an introduction, like a, like you, we, we had to like induct them into, into VR in that way. Now I work with older adults. Okay, so I also had to come up with a method in order to show it to people who A, never really used a te technology, B, are more fragile, right? Um, they have a lot more uh, health things to watch out for, like preventing falls. And so there's a lot of safety involved in it. Um, so it goes beyond that as well. So you also have to figure out who's using it. Of course, you, you'll figure out who's using it, but then think about how, um, they will need to try it for the first time. So I took into consideration a few things, uh, such as our, like liability, for example. So I had everyone sign a uh, workout waiver because we had that already for working out. And that's a physical activity. Um, I started our customers sitting down. You know, uh, I started by demoing on a big screen first and then showing them the concepts 
Um, and I do this already because I teach things like, um, like, you know, the iPad and iPhones. I mean, that, that was stuff that I was teaching like right when it was brand new. So then I had to translate a lot of the way that it works. So, so for example, the buttons may feel intuitive to us to hold the controllers a certain way or press it a certain way, but it, that's not intuitive for others. So, um, you know, grasping their arms and then trying to, um, explain what you're doing that they may, they can relate to in real life. So, um, I would tell them to like, you know, how would you hold something like if you're holding a, um, like a paintball gun, you know, and then have them grip my hand. I say, okay, now if you had to pull the trigger, what would you do? And to have them, you know, try that motion so that they get used to like, oh, that's what I do. So there's a button there, you know, there's buttons here. Um, that kind of stuff that you want to kind of put into a specific method on, on getting people into it. Um, and then as far as just getting into the industry, it is a small industry, you know, like we all know each other uh, and, and that's really great. So it really makes it so that when people want to jump in and kind of learn the ways of VR, it's still at the ground floor. You know, people are accessible. You can, you can reach out to nearly anyone, you know, and get a response because it's such a small community. Um, and because it's newer, the people who are doing it right now are very, very passionate about it. You know, you'll, you'll have people like with any technology who just kind of want to get in on it because it's a cool new thing, but not really have the same passion for it. But, you know, you working in healthcare, it's like, that's what I do. Right. So there's a lot of people who um, are doing very cool stuff, you know, and there are programs that are like with Oculus, they have like, they have programs that help people who are just getting started. Um, and, and then you can join groups on Facebook as well and um, on the discord to talk with people and kind of find the community that works for you you know the people who are responsive to you people who are doing the same things as you are but um that's something that i just do naturally um because ultimately in vr i do it because it's fun i don't need to do it for money or anything i mean i i i, I feel very privileged to say that but i don't have to create anything for anyone or, but myself. And, and I get a lot of enjoyment out of that. So I can do kind of crazy stuff. Um, and so the people that I end up networking with are people that I genuinely love. Like I, you know, on my wall right in front of me are like pictures of, of us, you know, like meeting in real life or, you know, like just game developers, that uh, that we just meet. Um, I also do something uh, cause I, I'm just a little silly like this, but I, um, send out physical gifts every Christmas. So the people I meet or the people who are guests on my show, they fill out a, like, you know, a, a form and I send out Christmas cards that I hand write, uh, I hand prints. I also do things like, um, I make them little things like, uh, like magnets with their work logos on it. And then I send it to them for the holidays. Um, I sent out personalized ornaments this last one, this last holiday. And I do that because uh, they're like my friends, you know, and it's fun to do for me. I'm a crafter. Um, and then it also reminds us that like we're doing something that's virtual, but that's not all that you have to be like identify with, you know, people think it's like one thing or the other. Oh, and people say, Oh, I prefer a real book. I'm like, okay, well I do. I like real books and I also like the Kindle. Like you can like both things. So it's just like a fun reminder that, um, that I care about people and that, um, you know, that, that our relationship is meaningful and transcends outside of, of VR. So it's a, just a welcoming community. And I think that you could just, um, I would say for, for specifically for healthcare, when you're first starting out, um, Twitter is really great. Um, that is where I met most people <laughs> is Twitter um, because it's, it's so short and active. You could just start responding to people and, you know, the more you respond with people, the more they get to know your name. And then next thing you know, you're in DMs and, you know, just chatting with people. Um, and I think reaching out to people is totally fine right now. I mean, anybody is like just flattered that you would reach out to them really. Um, and you can just reach out to interview them. I mean, I've talked with people like, you know, people who are in anthropology, who are studying social VR as their, you know, their society study. So, um, so many new things happening. And um, 
And I always say a few things with VR. One is that we all kind of just have to um, help each other and do favors until someone starts making money, you know, kind of a thing. And then, you know, like we, some of us do consultation now, but for like larger companies and stuff. So a lot of people are still just helping each other out, helping out, you know, the little guy, the small studios, um, doing favors for one another. Um, that kind of thing too. Um, and also just always making sure that you're offering something um, in return, wh whatever that may be. And, and it's okay to talk with people, even if you don't have a project lined up. You know, I, I do that now. I like just, um, someone's doing cool stuff. I'll just say, Hey, you know, like, I really like what you're doing. Let's, let's just chat and we'll just chat like this on zoom. And, you know, I, I hear what they're up to and they hear what I'm up to. And then if there's collaboration, cool. If not, like you made a new friend. So, um, so yeah, a lot of different approaches, but yeah, you're in luck. It's, it's a very friendly, welcoming community. So I would just jump right in there and start talking to people that you find interesting and share your work. Yeah. I agree. Thank you so much for that. I'm just going to do the same thing. Learn about how I'm, I'm really pumped right now to look for use cases in healthcare because that's also from passion that we are in healthcare. It's, it's like the best thing. Thank you yeah. so much for that. Yeah, it is. Um, so I do consultation for a, um, um, some clinics and it, it's just like, there's so much application. So I told you that I used it because of, um, of cancer, right? But there are people who use it for children for pain management. And it, it's an alternative to opioids, right? Um, uh, addiction. So people are even doing that using VR as a way to combat opioid addiction. So there's, there's those, those ways that people are doing it, but then it also includes people who need to build that program, right? And then people to use it. So it involves so many different uh, people, uh, investors or people like stakeholders within, within it. Um, and then there are people like myself who do more like application uh, with like the consumer. Um, and I'm not necessarily like a good developer, by our by work with developers, and then I work with like our research team, that kind of thing. Uh, and so there's just so much that you can, especially healthcare. Um, so I, I read a projection that, of course, the number one thing that's going to be driving VR is going to be the gaming industry. Second to that is healthcare, and it's healthcare is projected to be. Yeah, you know, one of the it's, it is like one of the fastest growing use cases. It's, people don't often hear about it because it's like in studies still. Because you can't just mm -hmm. you have to go through so many different um, like the whole process, right, of doing like a research study and everything for and then publishing your work and then having others try and like replicate it. So a lot goes into the research process of it, um, and and that's still really open right now and I'm glad you're pumped because we need more people to do it and you can always message me like, like my stuff is on the screen right now um, I work with a lot of really cool people in healthcare they're doing like just awesome things everyone's just doing something super cool you know and it's just fun to hear about uh, and and then they'll, they'll like be a guest on my show or um, we'll just like have sessions where we bounce ideas off of each other that kind of thing so yeah, I'm excited to hear your progress with it. I am definitely going to be in touch. Thanks a ton. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, any questions? I, I got to echo that the, uh, the Twitter game is definitely strong for this community. I found a lot of opportunities that sometimes I don't qualify for, but definitely are available for people who do and give you an idea of what you should like upgrade yourself with to get to the points to get hired. Or, or even start the communication or start chatting. I've, I've definitely seen a lot of activity and a lot of the thought leaders post a ton of stuff. They're pretty active, just merging this technology with the personal lives. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. And I'm, I'll let you in on a fun fact about me. I did not go to school for technology. I went to school to be a chef. So you might have seen a picture in there of me doing a article for that's really cool <laughs> yeah so that's, that's really that's, really cool that's my background is <laughs> is food oh, um and i got into it because i have a passion for it you know oh, um and uh i convinced them that i knew what i was doing and turned out i kind of did so <laughs> it's okay and that's what i mean is like you could literally jump in and do it and the people that i get to meet 
are the people who are like way qualified to do it, right? They went to school to research and all kinds of stuff. And then I can kind of come in there and hear about what they're doing and then contribute in my own way. So, uh, you know, even if it's the stuff that you're like, okay, I, I can't do that. I mean, it's the industry where no one, none of us were like able to pick VR as a major, you know, I mean, we did technology, we did developing that kind of thing, but it's something that you can totally just jump into and do. And the more curious you are, um, the better it is because like, as you see, I went from just one thing to the next and I still do all those things. And I still keep all those contacts. So, um, it's okay to like jump around. I mean, I actually starting to do stuff with, um, augmented reality, you know, which I really enjoy. So are you going to do a, instead of beat saber, a, a chef saber then? <laughs> well, there's already Top like, I think, <laughs> there's like <laughs> that, that game. Um, so there are some things that like, they, you know, have that. Um, I will say though, uh, uh, again, on uh, like a enterprise level, um, there are some uh, things with um, augmented reality for kitchens. So um, like I worked um in corporate kitchens, but like imagine having a uh, headset or like just, it's better with glasses, headsets are not very practical in a kitchen um, that help you with the temperature of like the food you're making or timing it. It's a lot of automation. Um, there was somebody that I worked with that was a little, maybe a, a little bit too villainy with it, but he said like, what, can you like have it like zap you if you're doing something wrong? I'm like, oh my gosh, that's, insane so there's that aspect of technology where people are like take it a little bit too far but then there's also opportunities for you to try different things so inside in the um, industry for food there are people doing some cool things with technology and vr and then also for training as well i mean that's like the number one thing is training and then like like um like the empathy part of it i don't think i don't need empathy like let's like feel for each other but like empathy for like okay, I, I get it now. I'm in your shoes. And it gives me um, a concept, you know, um, to understand because of how real it feels, you know. That sounds so cool. The temperature for cooking. And keeping yeah. track of multiple items on the stove, maybe even. Yeah, I think that... Um, that could be like a bridge to... A better bridge, in fact, to society adopting more than games if it's if it's already at the home level right exactly and it's i really like um the um um augmented reality because it's more approachable it's like smaller you know like if you look at nreal glasses so actually i did an nreal pitch and my pitch um um, one, actually, I'm supposed to go to China, but I think I'm going to hold off for a little bit. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think it's great. Cause all you could, there's so many ideas, you know, and, um, I'm not really like afraid to share them because like, if someone builds it, cool. You know, like I said, like it's, this is like, I enjoy doing this stuff and I enjoy meeting people who do it as well. Um, and that's very important to do. And that's why I made this like more like an AMA because, you know, I've seen a lot of sides of people and studios and companies and, you know, my opinion differs a lot. Um, and again, I come from one side of, uh, you know, the Oculus Connect conference where the people I was talking to were really people that were guests on my, on my show or people in healthcare, right. Who were doing different applications for it. Um, and then the year after that, I started playing esports. So then, you know, I was also talking with gamers and then they, they bring in a whole new perspective. Um, and then somewhere between there, you're just going to find all these ideas of things that you can do. And um, I think augmented, augmented reality does bridge a lot. And I'll tell you something interesting. Um, I had one streamer who he tweeted about how augmented reality is going to like give you like unnecessary pop-ups, right? Of, um, of, um, commercials and you know it's just gonna like invade your life just like technology tends to do and um if you know lucas who did uh, where thoughts go he responded and i really loved his response he said it could also do the opposite and it can block out things you don't want to see as well so it's also like requires that thinking that is not just like uh, negative or a one shot, like, you know, it's this way or that way. Um, but understanding different perspectives of how the technology can work, you know, um, 
that's also really, uh, it's, it's great. And then again, using Twitter, talking with people with different ideas like that, but they give you like a perspective on how you can actually apply the technology. Hey, hey, um, Imagine my mom uh, checking the temperature of food that I'm cooking. <laughs> what was that, Justin? Uh, so when I read the bio for this event, <clears throat> um, I was really intrigued by where it says, learn the different ways you can jump into the industry and untapped opportunities like idle. Yeah. Yes. Why did you write that? The untapped opportunities lying idle. And what does um, that mean for you? Okay, so I will actually tell you because this is also one of the things that I am very passionate about, and that is getting um, people to <clears throat> adopt, not just use the technology, but the people who are in the position to make it grow, to do more with it, uh, like. In, in my presentation, uh, it, it, I showed you like showing people in rooms, right? And I've shown it to hundreds of different people, but that's like one at a time type of experience. Uh, and, and people are tr still trying to figure out ways to do it, like bring people together, like, um, uh, you know, like VR arcades you know, they'll have you like put on the headset and wear on the backpack and you guys are playing in a real space in VR type of thing. So there are different ways that people are trying to make it happen. Um, but here, you know, actually, let me go back to my slide here. Um, but there are things like uh, eSports, okay? For instance, look at this picture on the right. This is uh, G-Men, and I'm actually gonna cast their game this weekend, <laughs> versus Danglers. And you see that they're here. It's a 5v5 game, right? This is the game I play. But watching this right here, you see people that are on stage playing, okay? That means that there could be an audience watching that is like the camera person, right? And then they do interviews. So that's people who are um, casters or, or, um, or interviewers, that people are, who are hosts, who are um, in the entertainment business, who make this entertaining. And then you see that the shirts that they wear, those are um, sponsored. And you see some of them are holding these uh, stock guns. That's, that's a product, right? That's, somebody, that's a pro tube who uses that product. And then because of the amount that we play, in this game, you know, we play for hours and hours. Um, we're sweating, right? So then that's more different types of products. Um, and then you see some people are squatting and standing and some, this person over here is wearing knee pads. Um, that leaves room for people who are in like, um, like uh, doctors, like there is actual VR esports <laughs> doctor, you know, like sports doctors um, who address those types of issues. See, so you can, what esports does is a, it, brings in so many different people in the ecosystem. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna change the share just because uh, I'm moving the backpack is annoying me. <laughs> so, um, so I always talk about esports being a great ecosystem for anybody, like marketers, um, uh, people who, actually, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong one here. Was that, was that pre-COVID? Uh, yes. But it's interesting because one of the competitions that they do um, actually uh, puts them in smaller studios, right? Yeah. So I think, I think you can see this, but not hear it, right? I don't know if you can hear it. You don't have to hear it, but this is just some of the stuff that, you know, we do um, here. But you see this is social VR. And the first scene was um, uh, a party that we did for Oculus Connect. Here's interviews. You're showing, you're showing your browser right now are you trying to show something else oh yeah do you not see the video i'm oh, sorry let's try here okay now do you see the video ah here we go okay sorry about that um so like here's a party that's a that's a real life you know event that we threw with oculus and then the virtual event that we threw um these are our streamers who are um who do mixed reality um here i'm doing um interviews with people uh did you see like how they do mixed reality here um these are like our mixed reality streamers. So Toge here, he's actually a video uh, creator. He does um, trailers. So you might have seen some games that he's done trailers for. Uh, and this allows us to work with people who have, um, who work with mixed reality. But look at, look at what mixed reality can do, right? It uh, allows you to, actually, and I have it right here. 
easy our stream team it puts you in the game so i'm sure you you've heard of uh, of how you can show off the game but this was actually in one of the um research projects i was doing where we were going to be able to use mixed reality to show art with our art program because it you know puts them in it you can see what they're doing um and then that allows you to bring people into the game and that it's just another way to do production so um as you see like all these different ways it's not it's more than just being a developer it's more than just being like a streamer or creating um vr experiences it can be an entire experience so um imagine you are um well let's imagine vr esports so this is the number one thing i think is a is a really really a big untapped market because there are so few leagues there um you know like virtual athletics league um cvre is like a, a collegiate one a vr master league is where i i played onward and i cast and uh, so there's very few leagues and we all know each other okay so if you run a league that does not mean that you can just put on an event you know at a stadium you need people to help you with that. Um, and then people who do events like myself, I'm not interested in running a league. It's a lot of work to organize people and then organize the gameplay and tournament. All right. So, so right there, you have people who organize the tournament, the competition and the rules for that. And then you have people who have to market it and then and make it like entertaining or um, like uh, the assets for the show itself. Um, and then the game that's being played that includes the studio developers right um and then people who do outreach from that group so you have to work with them as well um and then what are you playing on hardware so currently i mean oculus is really the only one that's done any big esports stuff i mean actually i'm sorry htc vive uh, there's a lot more happening in china <laughs> you know there's more headsets and they're doing more with with esports for so they're they're often ahead but esports in general regular pancake flat screen gaming they sell out stadiums okay and they um they they outsell actual sports too i mean that is a huge market of people who go to a stadium like cheering with signs and fans and like you know just like merchandise to watch people click a mouse you know, essentially, and I know I'm not really supposed to like, I'm not going to hate on any gamers, but because I'm not a gamer and I didn't come from it, I understand there's like a mental thing with it. But like, that's like chess, like going to watch people do chess or like Sudoku, play chess or Sudoku. Um, it's not as, uh, as big, right? But esports found a way to really make it um, exciting. And now imagine now you go to a stadium and you see people playing it with VR headsets that adds such a big element and then it really makes it physical, right? So you have to see a different level of skill that, that makes them sweat. Like if you've seen the players play Echo, they are like, they're like sweating after a match, you know, cause it's so physically like involved. So, so um, I told you CVRE, they're a collegiate league. Uh, we are well, we were also working with um colleges because right now a lot more universities are implementing esports programs if they haven't already so we are working with a, a college to implement vr for their community because they just opened a, a virtual lab right and working with a virtual lab they had to work with uh, you know vendors who brought in the equipment um and then like all the different products to show off. And then they have students who are learning how to develop for it. But then what do you do, right? You wanna show it off. Well, esports shows off your game, the equipment, um, the skill that goes into it. You know, you can be a player, you can be a coach. Um, there's, it's just so much happening and it's not really being capitalized on. Um, Oculus did some things with it with uh, with esl and it didn't really work out well um we actually ran virtual tournaments so you could go into alt space to watch the tournament happen live and then we did it with mixed reality in order to show the player because you that's something you see in real life right but it's harder when you're doing it on on screen so 
Um, so that still allows us to have the entertainment and it allow, allows us to offer um, a learning opportunity. And then for colleges, if you're doing that with your, your tech lab, I mean, you can get your marketing department involved, right? You can get um, your physical department involved, your researchers. So, so many different people that can kind of study from this one thing that essentially is a fun game that's being played, right? But like if, if Valve would do that with their headsets and then compete with Oculus and uh, because right now it's like, it's hard to sell headsets. It's, it's bulky, it's expensive, but what if some of that was designated to people who were um, entertaining, right? And, and people would come and watch it and then learn about it as well. So that's, that's the aspect that I think is totally untapped in, in esports. It's because there's people who are working on it, like myself, um, but no one's there yet. No one's selling out stadiums yet. We've done the productions. We know how it works. We've done um, the games and we, we actually, um, V Respawn, we test the games to see which ones are competitive ready. You know, so I mean, that's even something we do. Like studios pay us to test out a game and tell it and tell them um, how can we make this good for competition or uh, what, what is it missing? That kind of stuff. Because p studios, um, they they are so focused on their game, but they rely so much on the people who actually play it to tell them what's wrong with it or what needs to be improved. It amazes me that that's the case. But even with, uh, with Allspace, when we first started doing the show, like I would have meetings with them or calls with them and they were asking me questions about producing shows, even though they've done show productions, right? And they created the technology, but they needed people who consistently did it to consult for them on their own product. You see, so I mean, that was something that I got to do. Um, so just getting involved in it, like you kind of find your niche for it. There's not money involved in the sense that like, I'm going to create a game and it's going to sell, you know, millions and all this stuff. I mean, Beat Saber did it and then they got bought out anyway by Facebook and Facebook's really like the big player here. And, and people are not really happy <laughs> with you know, having to use Facebook to log in. So then that also creates opportunity for maybe someone else to come in or for us to bring over different technology from China, you know? So uh, I hope that answers your question a little bit. I, I'm trying to unpack everything still. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. Let's, you know, let's take a moment. It, it um, kind of leaked into another question I had been thinking about how to ask you. Sure. Which maybe I'll, I'll try to word it is. This is an AMA. You can ask me anything. <laughs> however, however you want to ask me. The, I think the question that Priya asks is something that a lot of people wonder about is how to break into industry. And of course that leads to, you want to get a job, right? You want to get paid for what you do. You want to have a lifestyle that is supported by what you do. Mm -hmm. But what you do professionally, um, with the hive is a completely alternative, uh, I guess you could say career or job. And, and it's intriguing to me that people do this. Um, and that's why, you know, I find it really fascinating that you, you bring this kind of work versus you sit in those conferences, they, they, they showcase rather like corporate work that's being done. So the question would be, uh, like, how do you, how do you monetize or how do you, how do you ensure that if you go down this alternate career path, uh, more, more for passion, it seems like than more for the, the, I guess what, what attracts people to the corporate life is the stability. Sure. How do you ensure uh, that for this VR lifestyle? Well, I mean, insuring is such a hard word these days, right? So, um, I can I can tell you a few different things and strategies. Uh, and one, um, I wasn't actually sure who would be attending from what perspective. As like one of the things I wanted to touch on is that a lot of game studios, especially like small indie ones, they have a difficult time with marketing. As most companies, if you work in marketing, know that that's like some people's like that's the last thing they think about. You know, it's like they outsource it or have someone else do it for them. Um, and, and then we, we have a, a concept of what 
what marketing is. So like we have a stream team, you know, you saw a video of them, they're, they're showing off the game. So, so some studios will come to us and say, oh, we want you to play the game and just get views. Okay. So we had a client come to us and say, um, they had millions of views on their game. They had someone who was like really big in, in Asia with TikTok playing their game, millions and millions of views and it converted to nothing, you know, and they realized that, but not all game studios do. So you said converted to nothing as in he didn't get paid? He or she didn't get no, paid? no, 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 no. They like, it didn't, it didn't grow their game oh, oh, sales okay. or Even with a, a social media star. Yeah, exactly. So a lot of people say like, okay, well, we'll just have a bunch of cool content creators play the game and then that should be enough. But that doesn't do it, right? Because um, what people want and from what I've done with, with you know, my, my career is, is that people want more than just the product. You know, they want to be heard. They want to um, connect with people. And that's something that is a skill that I find people lack in the more I've adventured out. <laughs> I mean, I know I've been in the same place for a long time, but I've learned so much because I've been able to work with so many different people, different departments. Um, I've got to wear a lot of different hats. So I was able to understand a lot more um, from a traditional point, point of view. And um and people and the, the company that came to us about this, they said, yeah, we, we got all these views and it didn't really mean anything. So they hired us to do a, a marketing campaign for them because uh, it, it, I mean, we have a reach, right? We, we have people who have audiences and, you know, they're well-known streamers and, and they can play the game, same thing. But what we did was coordinate it, right? We, we have, you know, matching jerseys and we did it, um, on a schedule at the same time we did other things like um we uh we either turn it into a charity or we take a part of their game and make it like a, a fun meme and then we reach out to our network like i said it's a small small community reach out to the network and see who can be involved and who can help right um and the thing that is the thing is though is that studios aren't going to have a lot of money all right so in terms of thinking of like how to hire out for this, they'll think like, okay, well, we could just spend this much and boost things on social media. But, and I think right now is when people are starting to realize it more is that that is not what is staying, you know, like as, as the option it used to be right when, when it was still newer and we were reaching people, but now everyone is doing it. So you have to kind of like be creative in how you um, help people realize what they need to do. And, and since, um, you know, I'm uh, trained in um, like full service uh, experiences, um, I'm able to like help people realize that. And instead of focusing on, let's get a lot of people to see our product, it's more like, let's get people to help like be a part of us. You know, so we help build a community. Um, we help show them be more than a game, you know, that, that they are, they are people behind it and why they do it and what you can use it for. So it's like that experience that you're selling. Um, and I'm not, you know, I will be very truthful. It is really hard to make money because there are mostly small studios. And again, like um, the Respawn and the Hive is privately owned by myself and my business partner. And we both have, um, we both work in healthcare um, and we privately fund everything, right? So we can't like, we don't fund like, um, you know, like we have 35 people directly in our network, but we don't pay them all salary. Like everyone has their own specialty. So like they either are full-time streamers and that's what they do. And then we pay for uh, people like maybe like one administrator or somebody to do some of the work for us. And the thing is, is like my business partner here, Simmons, who you might know as Poo Nanners, he's like a legendary, you know, caster and gamer. Um, he's like, like one of the good guys, you know, he's all about like building that community and he's like in a bit of a privileged spot. Like I am where we want to help people. So we do like the first one's free, you know, or like we do things at a high discount for people in order to help them 
get to that level. But now with Facebook, um, you know, um, absorbing more of Oculus, I mean, they already owned Oculus, but making it more of a Facebook thing. Um, and the Quest now, the Quest 2 is out. It opens a lot more now for communities to grow. But you can't just put out a game and a product and let it grow. You need people to like wrangle them in and to make it something. And that's kind of where we come in. So we've built that goodwill within the community. Um, and it is like one of those things where um, when you're starting out with, with a small business, you know, business plans and, and how you're going to fund it, it's people do it in a lot of different ways, like venture capitalism or however you choose to do it. I choose to do it privately because I, I could, and I also don't like people to tell me what to do. So, so, um, so I can tell you that it's not easy to just jump in and make money, but there are ways. It just depends on the way that you want to do it. You can be a consultant, right? Which takes time for you to be experienced in. Um, but you again can offer a different perspective. Like Priya, you, you're, you are, um, new to VR, right? But maybe not in general to healthcare. There's things that like you know about that you can consult on. You know what I mean? So, okay. so you kind of like kind of draw in on the things that um, make you who you are and why you're different. You know, like like I said, I don't have a degree in technology. You know, um, and I. I didn't go to school for it. I mean, I took, I took classes. And I, I continued to learn, but you, I had to do that on my own, like independent study. But I can tell you that that has not stopped people from hiring me for consulting um, on their clinic, you know, or with their um, charity event for golf, for um, like the people who like uh, do charities for a specific cause. Like um, there's a gentleman who worked um, for golf with uh, um, veterans with PTSD. That is like, I you you wouldn't like hear about that, right? Um, but that's what he does, and so he needed me to help him uh, digitize it because he meant physical golf, but VR allows those type of operations to um, scale up by using the technology. Um, the same thing with um, consulting for the clinics. You know, uh, the the consultation fee. For whatever it is you choose um, to work for, um, and then adding the skill onto it, like um, I can help your clinic set it up, you know, and then I can teach you how to um, help people use VR for the first time, how to make them comfortable using it, because I've spent all those that time helping um, older adults use it. You know, I've, I've seen and helped people use all kinds of different apps and games. I've talked to a lot of people so that I can, I can help with that and I can write up those plans. And then the skills that like, just professional skills that you learn, like um, writing a business plan, proposals, um, that kind of stuff too. Uh, but it's really important to network because you can't do it all on your own. And I cannot stress that enough. I always say that like, there are people that do are so much more talented than I am, but I get to work with them. You know, we get to collaborate and work together and we all bring a little bit of something different to it. Um, and I know that they can't all work for free. So I advocate for them. So I'm um, the negotiator too. So I will be the one who, um, I, I also found that is that uh, uh, content creators and streamers, because it's still new, don't know how to price themselves out. So I help them find that price you know, that price point for them that works, um, that uh, gives them what they need to survive, but then also um, is, is what it's worth to the client as well. Um, and also I encourage people to not constantly do things for free if you can't do that. And so when um, we have a, a project or, or, or what have you, that's a, it's a paying project, I absolutely pay all the people to do it. You know, um, and even if that comes out of, you know, out of my pay, and that's what happens when you start your own business, right? You, you're not making all the, the money immediately because there's so many people that are involved with it. So I can say that it's not something that you can just like jump into and do, but I can tell you that the hive has produced people who now professionally stream. That's what they do now. That is their full-time job. They are full-time streamers. You know, um, people who have their own shows that spring into different opportunities. So it just, I, I mean, I'm really like, 
I'm not saying like, it's not me that did it. It's, I, I'm just like, I'm really proud that something that um, I helped build, you know, inspired people to do something more. Um, and that's something that we all can do. Um, and it's, it's a journey, right? There's just no like bulletin board where you're like, okay, that's my skill. I'm going to take it and apply for it. Sometimes you have to like create that opportunity for yourself. And then you have to advocate for yourself to know like what you can work for and what you're willing to do because it's, I'm at a point where, um, you know, people ask me for a lot of different like favors and, and things like that. And for the most part, I, I, I can do all of it, but I do have to sometimes say, okay, what you're asking for is a full on service and, and I have to pay my team and, and getting them to understand that. And they'll see that value. Like I said, the, some studios realize it when they get a lot of views, but it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't build their community. You know, um, they'll realize it. And, and that's, that's how you build that clientele. So I'm sorry. I wish I could just tell you that, yeah, just do this and immediately get paid. <laughs> I can almost imagine, uh, Vivian, with the kind of perspective that you come, already ideas coming into my head and you mentioned that you want to share that experience and enable people for the kind of thought leader and the position you have been in. I would, I would start thinking about the ways right now, probably I won't be immediately able to get to them, but since I'm already immersed in healthcare and I am working on a healthcare uh, digital product and applications would patients directly use or even like people in the clinics use it's a very dry application so how do I make it more engaging how do I make it uh, easier for patients to respond to our questions and not burden them with these stressful responses that they have to give in the middle of them being sick the kind of experience that you shared as well so maybe I'll start small and just to mention how do you get in with this is probably my way of thinking about it, that I'll just learn as much as I can about what other industries are doing and then bring them little by little into what I feel like to be able to do. Mm -hmm. I'm also a physical therapist by training. Okay. And then just happened to jump into technology. I don't have a formal training in technology, but I got into product management and I love it. So I won't be practicing physical therapy anymore but I can help physical therapists grow and provide remote care so that's something which is my long-term thought process as to how can I contribute and I think we are has that potential just learning about it is exciting for me right now and it just came this this session came at the really right time for me so really good exciting. I'm so glad and you'll be amazed at the opportunities that come up. I mean, right now we are working with a client who is in Ghana, you know, and mm. what they're doing is working with their schools for technology, and, but they need help with people who know how to do it and run a production. And there are not, actually, I don't know any other people who are, they do portions of what we do, but we do a full encompassing um, service. And, and not just by ourselves, like we work with partners and stuff, but you can come to us for the full, like, um, we can do the real event physically. Like you saw, like we, we can throw a party. We can put that together. We have the, the talent. Um, the, we have the players, we understand the technology works. So that kind of stuff. So they are, um, that, you know, they need our help to make that happen. So that's like working with, again, colleges, universities, all these other places that, you know, you can bring the idea to them too. And like, working in healthcare and having the background in physical therapy as well. I mean, that's great. Like you'll find ways that each thing connects, you know, one good thing leads to another. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's exciting. And I kind of almost feel in my personal realm as well. I haven't been using PR as much. And then just with the whole COVID situation, I've started thinking about how I, how I can, get better at my fitness levels and I have friends who are using these workouts etc so that's mm -hmm. like stay at your homes and still come together but come together for something everybody is passionate about not just talk because then social media allows you to talk and do videos but more like a physical thing mm -hmm. so yeah yeah taking it step by step I guess yeah um Justin did I answer your question or did you have any follow-up? Oh, I've got tons of questions, but I'm, I don't know <laughs> if I should ask all of them because I'm probably going to go over time. 
Well, um, I mean, you know, you asked the original question. So was there anything oh, you that you the, the one about career direction? Yeah. Uh, I think, I think, uh, for the most part, yes. Um, maybe I'm stuck in, well, I'm stuck in another question right now is for you to obtain like people coming to you as I want to get consulted. I'm looking at your numbers right now. So it's just on Twitter. You have 1200 followers, sorry, 1600 followers, 1200 following for the Vive or the Hive? The Hive. The hive? Oh yeah. Th yeah. That's the Hive. Yeah. The Hive. Yeah. So for the Hive, for instance, like, can you give an example of some numbers that you need to achieve to get people to actually notice you? Oh, well, okay. So that's the high. That's not my own Twitter. Right. Um, I mostly work out of my own Twitter. Um, so this is, this is the part that's really fun for me to tell because I always say like, I'm not really doing anything special, you know? I mean, sure. I think people like think, I mean, when you're doing it yourself, you don't really think it's like all that cool. Cause like you're immersed in it and you're doing your own thing. But like, I personally like, I'm not really doing anything, you all know? Right. Yeah. I mean, no, that's how I feel sometimes. And, and that will happen to you. Um, while you're doing all this, you're like, Oh my gosh, I'm like, I, I, I'm not doing enough or, or whatever. But like every time you go out there and meet people, it doesn't matter how many people follow you. It really doesn't. I know it's impressive for some people because they're still in that mindset. Like, Oh, I have this many followers. And for the people who monetize off of followers, that makes sense. But a lot of content creators aren't making money off of followers. They make money off of sponsorships, like commercials. That's how they make their money is commercials. Um, but like for me, that's not that many followers, right? On Twitter. I mean, the hive, um, actually I don't even run that one because the hive's on hiatus right now. <laughs> funny, funny enough. Um, but, uh, the host for the hive is, is um, actually Nava because I like transitioned it to her even though people were like, I mean, that little wing, that's actually my signature, the little heart thing. I mean, people were like, you can't, because that's like, you're the high, right? But Nava brings in her own, Nava Berg, she brings in her own network of like all the people that she knows and the contacts that she's made um, and be a part, a part of it, right? Uh, and all I did was just do a show to start out with in, in Allspace. And then I just found people who were, you know, like-minded or ask my friends and then we just kind of like go from there but I didn't have I mean I wasn't even really using Twitter but uh I consulted for you know um Samsung and the Microsoft and it was like it's simple it's not like I'm a con uh, I'm a con uh, cons consultant and I work there full time you know that's why con uh, consultants they can charge a lot of money because you're taking like all the not just their time like when people talk to me for an hour they're not just paying me for the hour they're paying me for all of those hours that i put in that i am simply just telling you whereas i put in the time to figure out what went wrong and i can just tell you so that's the time that you put into what you do um not so much on focused on like the followers i should be a little bit better about that like i should care more about that but if you look at like our youtube mostly because we're not a youtube channel so it doesn't i don't really i'm not focused on how many followers we have on youtube you know um you just have to have a good product that you're doing and just talk to people i mean i can't stress enough how important it is to just reach out to people and chat with them um that's how Dom, she just messaged me, you know? Um, yeah, she, right. <laughs> yeah, she just messaged me and I do a lot of these things. I just did a show like, a, you know, like a week ago or something like that. I mean, the, and these are friends and then I help them too. Like, I'm like, hey, I know she had like a show. Do you need help with production? You know, or, or once in a while, like I will like sponsor something and I want to make it clear. It's not that it's not like, oh, I'm a wealthy person and I just have all this money. You know, it's just that I manage my money specifically for certain, certain, certain ways, you know? And so, and that's a totally different topic of how to manage your own finances and stuff. But to me, like sponsoring something like a, I will buy personalized jerseys as a, as a prize is a quick, easy way, you know, to be involved with the community and get your name out there, you know, and network with people. And then also show that like you do invest as well, 
you know? So I can tell you that you could have zero followers, you know, and just talk to people and, um, you know, just be like authentic. Like I can't, I, you just have to be, you have to do exactly what you like, you know, and be exactly who you are because it gets really tiring if you don't do that. And you're like constantly chasing the followers and chasing the influencers. I hate that word, you know, it's just stuff like that. But ultimately that's not what matters. It's like, I put my heart into what I've learned and I'm sure that you can tell just talking to me that I've done a lot of different things. So I'm telling you from experience, but I don't have millions of people watching what I do, but for some reason I do have important contacts. Like you can ask me to reach out to, you know, Oculus or whomever, you know, just from all these little projects that I've done and I can, cause I made those contacts. So it's a, uh, you know, qu quality, I suppose, or quantity. Hey, Justin, if you want to like uh, earn money um, through um, XR industry, what I suggest is that you create value first for the community. You create value and keep creating. For example, like my X reality uh, meetup, I didn't get any money and I even devote my, my time. And I had another junior designer. She is working on the banner every week. I have to pay her. And I also uh, pay the, you know, the platform fee annually. And then I did all the setup, put all my time in, and I haven't received, like I haven't get money in. But uh, what I get is that I, I treat this as kind of community service. I know a lot of people, they go to church and then they devote one day to kind of help the community or help something and they make uh, life better and for me I view this as my service to kind of return to the society so but by doing this I I I, I met a lot of friends for example like Vivian I reach out to her and she just immediately say yes let, let's pick a day so you never know um, who you will meet and then by giving out the value for example like right now it's all like you know like my time and then I uh, kind of, I will organize like a folder later on for Vivian and I will post uh, to my social media so everyone can access for uh, Vivian's experience for free. So that's uh, what I think because before I read some articles and I had uh, business mentors, they all say the same thing, like you start providing your value first and don't ask for return for so in a two, in a short amount of time. For example, like uh, before I remember when I invite Charlie Fink, uh, uh, my meetup uh, members only, I, I only have like 180 people or 100 something people. And right now um, I grow twice. Right now it's almost 400. So, I mean, you never know, like, cause you couldn't control people. All you need, you, all you can do is to kind of like keep guilt, uh, giving value and because this is kind of like um, I, I set up X reality only for one year right I set up last May and this I, I think one and a half year so I haven't really generate anything from it but I built a small community and I made a lot of speakers and also I think um, for example like sometimes we see some people like for example like Julie Smithson Ellen Smithson, they build like an empire of metaverse, right? But, you know, uh, I listened to Ellen Smithson's po podcast. He built his podcast since 2013. And right now it's flourish, you know, right now. But sometimes I would think like, why some people, they just like become so big suddenly, but actually not. They, they uh, plant the seed. You see, like it has been seven years, right? So yeah, so he built his um, own engine, AR, VR engine, and then kind of trying to beat uh, Unreal and Unity. So I think sometimes when we see a lot of big people, we, 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 we want to be like that, that's great, but it takes a lot of time. For example, like five years, seven years for people to know you, right? So I think maybe 
um, I, I mean, I, I, I add your LinkedIn and, um, and we, we, uh, you join a lot of meetup and I know you a little bit. So I think, uh, I, I think you had a, a great uh, skills of communication and also, uh, you have a lot of really good backgrounds and you are passionate about VR, AR, XR. So I think, um, um, maybe start posting some, uh, start writing some articles and maybe take some people right to give you feedback I think one of your posts like tag me so I kind of went in and see and yeah and, and kind of uh, response to it so I think yeah maybe start from this start from what you can do and start building something for example at the beginning uh, how, how I get to VR AR is that I really want to get in but my background is UX UI designer um, I don't know how and I don't know development. So I start reading some books and I shoot like a super small, like, a, you know, like uh, five minutes videos. And then every day, uh, I think every day or every week, and then show one AR, VR apps and then share something on LinkedIn. And then it generate a lot of views. So that's why I get, I, I contact with Charlie Fink because I'm going to speak one of his book and I want to get his permission. And I remember, I think it was two years ago and he was living in New York. And I thought I was, I will get rejected because he is so big. He's the leader. No, he's really it. nice. <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah. It's like, <laughs> you know, because before I, I introduced one of another, like another author's book and I got kind of reject because she asked me to take down all the content that I post on LinkedIn and other social media because she thinks that if I kind of reveal her book, then she might not be able to sell it because people can see the content uh, through my social media. But that was not my intention. I just want to share like, oh, this is a great book. And then please buy, and I even show all the purchasing link but um, yeah, but some authors, they are concerning about the revealing of their content. And I respect that. So after that experience, I told myself if I want to, uh, you know, like show other people's books or content, I have to get permission. So that's why I get contact directly to Charlie Fink, even though like my community was so small, like 100 people. 30 yeah. people, it doesn't matter. I just want to share with people. And you know what Charlie Finker said, uh, which inspired me to uh, create this uh, meetup. He told me that, yeah, Dom, you just, you just tell everything out of my book. I don't care. Every time, because this is such a fast growing uh, industry, right? Once I write a book, uh, I publish and I'm done. I'm moving to the next thing because this is the fast growing stuff. And I don't think it's not necessarily to build uh, or like create uh, tutorials because once you create a tutorial, the technology just moves to the next one. You know, you never, it's like a, a super fast growing uh, industry. So I just like document it, you know, I didn't own those stuff. So, uh, and you know, every time when I publish a book, I, uh, only 10 K people buy or, I forget what number. It's like a really small community because extra community is just that small. So that's why every time when I write a book, only 10K people buy. And then I told him that, hey, actually, because before I self-told some AR stuff and I post on my uh, YouTube and I got tons of views and I got a lot of uh, developers from Indian they are so into AR, VR technology and they wrote me and asked me about technology uh, skill stuff. And I told him that, hey, like actually, um, there are so many different um, people outside of USA. They are so into VR and AR and they want to know how to get in the industry. And then I told to Charlie Fink and we start talking about China, like the AR, VR, XR industry in China. And I feel that there's, there's a kind of like a, a responsibility fall for me at the same time that maybe if I can start something and then every week I kind of help 
local or some other business owner to implement some of the extra uh, knowledge inside their head. So maybe when they encounter some business um, strategy or difficulties, they can think of XR and kind of um, purchasing more XR stuff and learn or invest XR stuff so we can grow the XR community together. So next time when Charlie Fink, he um, wrote a book, published a book, he will get like double buyers, right? So I was thinking about, yeah, maybe we can kind of start growing. And I really love um, AR, VR technology. So I think, yeah, so maybe that's, I don't know, it's, it's just me. I, I am similar to Vivian. I know Vivian is like loving gaming. And for me, I was like, I want to grow this community. It's like just thinking we, we can make it bigger. So, so that, that, that's my thinking. So I don't know, Justin, what's your goal? Maybe uh, there's a book called Starts With Why, right? You start with why you want to do it and you keep doing it. Yeah. Um, and, and you know what? Charlie is really nice. And Alan yeah. too. Yeah. And I, I, I was just looking. It's funny when people say, do you know so-and-so? I'm like, I'm not sure. And then like, well, we follow each other or something. Or we've had conversations. And everyone's really like, um, again, it's so small. I always say like, if 10 people know you, then you're famous. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, and I wouldn't worry about like that. Um, I'm actually kind of like, I like doing the background stuff. I do the front facing stuff because um, I can, uh, but I like doing the things in the background and helping others. So, you know, figure out your niche. If you like being on camera, then that's what you should do. And by the way, like I have people um, who, like not just work for me, but use the hive as the next a way to learn something, you know, and they're open about it. And I'm totally fine. I tell people like, if you want to work on the hive and produce shows and stuff and then learn how we do it and then do your own thing, like you can, people have done that. They've made their own podcasts, their own streams and their own shows. And I'm, I'm I think that's really cool. Um, and it's nice, you know, to hear from them like a year later and they're like, oh, this is what I'm doing. And it was thanks to you or something. So that's really nice and inspiring when you can do that. And then that, again, to Don's point, just adds to your experience of, of what you offer. Um, that's definitely something that you'll hear a lot is value added for the content you put out. Hmm. Yep. Yeah. Thanks okay. for all the, uh, the tips, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. be really cool to hear the stories. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And, and also you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, I also run like, you know, a discord and well, no, I, I'm in it. It's, it's mine. It's a, but other people run it. Um, yeah, I'm, I really have a hard time doing things that are just specifically me. Um, but uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe I should, you could do that maybe promote yourself a little bit better. I can tell you that because that's something I don't do very often, but you know, um, I should, and I could, but maybe you get more out of it. So some people are, are, have that kind of drive. So if that's something you're looking for, um, reach out to me. I can introduce you to people too. I'm happy to just do straight introductions and stuff. Cool. Thank yeah. you so much for taking your time to do this. Yeah, of course. You're welcome. It's yeah. nice meeting you. Yeah. Thank you, Thanks Vivian. So much. For, thank yeah. you, Dominique. Thank you. For Thanks, organizing Dominique, yeah, for organizing this again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Vivian, for being our uh, speaker today. And uh, yeah, so we wrap it, wrap it up right now, right? Okay, thanks. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah. hopefully uh, see, you, see, see you guys soon. Yeah, bye-bye. Yeah, thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye, thank you.